This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, journalist Nancy Youssef on reporting from the front lines. You know, you'd go in every time and sort of ask yourself, am I going to come out with 10 fingers and 10 toes? Like you knew you might not make it. Look, when I started in 2003, if you said journalist, it was like waving a white flag. And now we see states that really treat information, the distribution of information, as warfare. You know, there have been 26 hostages who have been released during the Biden administration. 26 in 26 months, basically. How many do we know about? We know about a few of them. I just wonder what happened with those other, I don't know, 20 cases that we're not as familiar with, but there was a, there was a solution. Nancy Youssef, welcome to Chatter. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here too. We're Sadly, we are not together together. We're both in undisclosed locations. We're both in undisclosed locations. On assignment for exactly. America. Um, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm so happy to see you. Yeah. You know, it's it's like a before March 29th and after March 29th. You know, it's uh, yeah. honestly like I was out to dinner last night and the service wasn't very good. And I thought, what am I complaining about? Do you understand what your colleague's going through? Yeah. So I'm filled with profound gratitude that uh, yeah. we're okay. And, uh, and uh, a lot of focus on Evan. Yeah. And for those who will soon know about this story, um, Nancy, of course, is talking about Evan Gershkovich, um, her Wall Street Journal colleague. I think we all think of Evan, even those who don't know him, as part of our whole journalistic tribe. Journalists are very much a tribe of people. And so even if you don't work with somebody at the same paper, you think of them as your colleague. Uh, but Evan has now been, uh, since Nancy said, in late March uh, in prison in Russia, uh, where he has been doing really tremendous reporting for quite a while uh, at the Moscow Times. Uh, he was doing stuff uh, also for the journal, obviously, doing a lot of very compelling reporting during the pandemic in Russia uh, and uh, has been arrested and accused of being a spy, which he and his employer and the United States government vociferously deny. And, and we'll get into Evan's case. And there's actually been some really interesting developments in that case, which you all at the journal have reported on. Um, but really what I brought you here to talk about was, in, you know, the risks that journalists face when they are reporting from dangerous areas. And you have a lot of experience with that, reporting from conflict zones, reporting from war zones. Uh, you have colleagues who've been in situations like Evans before. You have colleagues who we still don't have home yet. I'm thinking of Austin Tice as being a big one. So I thought it'd be great for us to talk so maybe readers or listeners can get a, a better appreciation of, of what it's really like for reporters to work in these situations. Um, and I want to talk about you. So before we get all into that, we're going to talk about Nancy. Nancy and I have worked together before at the Daily Beast. We are dear friends. I love her. She's one of the best out there in the business. Um, we have right great fun again. together. So tell me about young Nancy. Where does it all begin? Where did you tell us where you grew up and tell us what you remember about being young and being interested in journalism? Like when did you first start thinking about the news? So I'm the daughter of two Egyptian immigrants who um, came here uh, in the 1970s. Um, my dad came here with two hundred and twenty dollars, ended up in Washington taking government work because um, we I was born out just outside of New York City. And my dad had faced a lot of racial discrimination, and he was so scared that he would be fired for being North African, for being Arab, that he decided to move to Washington, take government work, hoping that it would lead to more job stability. So that's kind of how we ended up here. And so if you grew up in D.C., there is no real local news because it's so subsumed by national and international news. And so... Right. Um, newspapers were one of the very few Western things that were sort of allowed in our house. I remember my dad having a Washington Post and an Arabic English dictionary and using the Washington Post to learn and improve his English. And so, so I think if there was an attachment to journalism, it started there. And I think when you're a, a, an immigrant's child, you already sort of feel like a constant observer because you're not quite American. You're not quite Egyptian. You're kind of always feeling like the outside. And I and, and isn't that what journalism is? We're professional yeah. observers. And so I, I don't even know if I chose to be a journalist so much as my life led me that way. Yeah. 
Um, so all those reasons, I think, um, made me want to be a journalist from middle school. And uh, and I started working at papers then, you know, school papers. Yeah. And then... Did you have like a beat at the school paper? Yes. Um, I've had faculty as a beat. Ooh. I've had general news. I've had um, administration. I, I got all the geeky beats, like none of the fun ones. You, you were just pissing off people in power since the beginning. Oh my gosh, from the very beginning. <laughs> from the very beginning, honestly. And then... But like speaking Arabic and being um, a Muslim American and being from this region was like weird. And then 9-11 happened and all of a sudden all these things that I'd been exposed to were essential to understanding the the things happening around us. So then um, I went to Iraq and I was I'd never done any national reporting. I went from the Detroit Free Press and I'd only went to the Detroit Free Press because it was right after 9-11. I thought, who's going to appreciate an Arabic speaker? Detroit will. And I just called them, cold called them, said, hire me. And they did. I didn't know you cold called them. And that's how you got the job. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were probably couldn't believe their luck. They're like, oh, my God, she's a reporter and she speaks this language that we yeah. desperately need skill in. Yeah. He literally packed my car. Don't you remember those days when you could fit everything yeah, in the car and that. drove the nine hours up? And it was the best experience. I, I mean, I love Detroit and I love Detroiters. Um, so then... I had nothing. I just went from there. And, and um, are we allowed to curse on this yeah. podcast? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> the Detroit Free Press, many, many newspaper sales ago, was a Knight Ritter paper. And they literally just put out an email that said, who wants to go cover the war? And I, I, this will sound adorable to some of your younger listeners. They thought the war would be a few months. So it was like, yeah. you could be a war reporter for a few months. <laughs> and, um, and my editor, who ended up being my editor for the next 12 years, he called me and he said, do you have any national reporting experience? And I said, no. Do you have any international reporting experience? No. And these are all quotes, by the way. Can you do anything? And I said, well, I speak Arabic. And he said, fine, we'll send you to Jordan. If you don't fuck up, we'll go from there. Click. And that was the start of my journalism career in the Middle East. Okay. Amazing. So now um, I'm in Iraq and I'm in my twenties or and and you're watching war and it's it's and there's no pre- preparation for it and you're just we're just going into central Baghdad and um and that's it. And you know, people think the war in Iraq was sort of lost over a period of months. It wasn't. It was a matter of days. Mm. It was and this is where the Arabic was so helpful because you saw like a bunch of soldiers and Marines told guard the space and an Iraqi man with the ex who had the expectation that a bunch of Arnold Schwarzenegger looking people were going to come in, liberate their country, then give them the sheet of paper for what ministry they report to and leave and leave being the most important part of that sentence. Yeah. And instead they go up to this, the Arnold Schwarzenegger looking guy and they say, dear sir, in Arabic word, I go Frank job. And the guy holds the gun up and says, get back. Uh-huh. Dear sir, get the fuck back because his only job is to go to that space. So you just saw these series of misunderstandings happening within the first few days. I wrote the war ended April 9th. I wrote a story April 20th that said this wasn't going well because you could oh, just wow. feel it. And so I did that for four years and and then um, came to the Pentagon because I knew war anecdotally, but I'd never studied it. I, I was watching all these decisions, the impact, but I didn't know how they were being made. And so um, I did that. And then Arab Spring happened. I went back to the Middle East. Um, and w- once um, that was clearly not going to go the way I think some had hoped, in 2014, I came back. And this is my second um, rotation. And um, and that's that's the short um, version of, of, of how it happened. So it was all – I never really intended it, but um, I'm glad it's worked out that way. And I – and what I basically covered is war f- front lines that I think we think of war front lines as sort of huge masses of troops. But what I've been covering are conflicts that are born between people inside the Humvee and the people outside the Humvee. Mm-hmm. That's the front line, that Humvee going through a street. Yeah. And that's been my job is understanding what it's like to be in the Humvee. And I know that as an American, having been in it and you don't know who's a threat. And I also know it outside when you're looking at people who are treating you like an Iraqi, like an Egyptian, like a Libyan, like whomever. And, and thinking of you as a threat. That makes me think of how you, you, you talked about being in your home growing up where you feel like I'm sort of not American, I'm sort of not Egyptian. I'm kind of floating in this, like, you're sort of like perennially spending your life going down between those two paths. What was it like? Because I know in, in covering the military, one thing that you have is both, I've always thought, is is a lot of appreciation and, 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 and sympathy and empathy for the troops 
And also just like often a lot of appropriate skepticism uh, for their commanders and Pentagon officials holding them to accountable, which is exactly what we're supposed to do. What did you learn about like these kids who were there, right? I mean, did they think the war would be over quickly? Were they scared? Were they excited? I mean, what was your impressions of watching these young people, I presume some of whom you know were younger than you were, thrust into this war that, of course, we all thought was going to just kind of go like the first Gulf War, done and dusted, and we're, right. we're finished? Um, a lot of them had never left their country before. Mm-hmm. And then they were in this situation and were handed tremendous responsibilities. And many rose to the occasion. I think over time, what you found is they weren't fighting the broader war as defined by people in Washington or in wearing stars on their shoulders. They were fighting for their brother, for the guy next to them. And you were watching in real time the sort of scars of war sort of landing on them, right? Mm-hmm. You'd go on an embed and uh, you know, the, the Humvee would come back and an EFP had gone through and there was just mist left of, who, of somebody inside, you know? Mm-hmm. You were watching these scars and asking yourself, um, what is the long-term impact? And, and that's what I think about with them, that they, they weren't fighting the bigger cause. They were fighting for one another, mm-hmm. for their own survival. Um, mm-hmm. And that people went in with the best of intentions, but didn't fully understand what was happening around them or what mm-hmm. was being asked of them. And it just, it was those misunderstandings over and over again. So um, it was hard to be mad at them because um, this is the circumstance they found themselves in. Sure. They're it was hard right to right. be forgiving as well because you're watching the impact on yeah. Iraqis every day. Yeah. What about, how did you feel going in there as a reporter? You, you'd never covered a war or a conflict zone, right, by that point. So what are your, what's going through your mind when you get there about your personal safety? I mean, are, are you scared? Are you thinking about that? Or do you just kind of throw yourself into the job and, but that other stuff you stow away in the back seat. You know, you'd go in every time and sort of ask yourself, am I going to come out with 10 fingers and 10 toes? Yeah. Like you knew you might not make it. And the the beauty of youth is you don't know what it means. You're like I, I would think, well, if I don't make it, I've had a good life. You know, 25. <laughs> nice. 25 yeah. years are pretty good. Right? Because you don't, this is the this is the the cruelty of surviving it. And when others right. don't, you realize that over time how much they're missing. Right. But at the time, you don't understand. Um, but security was a huge part of it. I, I was always trying to sort of stay in the middle. And that by that, I mean, I didn't want to be the most cautious person. And I didn't want to be the most reckless person. I wanted, frankly speaking, someone to be a more attractive target to me on either mm. side of me. And that's what I was trying to walk the entire time. And the other thing you have to do is find whatever is comfortable for you. Mm-hmm. And to not judge anybody whose comfort zone is different than yours. Okay. We had people who came to Iraq and would not leave the bureau, would not leave the hotel. That's as far as they could go. That's mm. as far as they could go. And you had to respect that. Because if you ask somebody to go outside of that, they're endangering you, they're endangering everybody else around you. Right. And then you have to think creatively within those confines. So how do you report when you're scared to leave? How do you report um, when you don't know um, if things are changing, you're, you're constantly trying to figure out ways. How do I feel the pulse of the city? How do I, so like, I would do silly things. Like I would go get my hair done, not to get my hair done, but to listen and not say anything, just listen to the other women chattering. How much of it was complaining about their war? How much was it about their husbands? I do that at grocery stores, Mm -hmm. constantly looking for ways that worked within my own level of comfort. Um, but allowed me to get a pulse of where things were. Right. And then, you know, you have a staff. I mean, it's, it was a staff of 21 people. I never managed anyone and now manage them in a war zone. You're trying to create a camaraderie. Right. You're trying to, among different sects at a time when there's nothing but sectarian violence around you. And a lot of local people who came to work for the Bureau, probably. 21 too. of them. Yeah. And that was all, it was all local. Okay, yeah. It was all local. It was all local. And so yeah. you're trying to create loyalty. You're, you're, it's a war zone. You're trying to create an incentive for them to be invested in the coverage. Right. Um, so it was all those things. So it was a really challenging time um, for sure, but it is the foundation of everything I do now. Yeah. How did preparation for reporters then, and by preparation I mean what your employer would do to kind of train you for going into a dangerous area, compare then to the systems that we have now before we, newspapers, news organizations, send people into places like you know, Afghanistan, when we still probably have more active reporting there, or even, or Ukraine now, how, how did it compare 
then and what's the system more like today? So in both cases, they have you kind of go through this week-long training where you're taking hostage. and Pretend hostage, to be clear. Yeah, they put a mask on you <laughs> so you understand what it is to have that happen to you and first aid training and all this. And and they do that. They did that then, then and they do that now. Um, uh, I think the difference is that um, time has sort of taught people um, what they need to consider. I think there was an assumption that if you had a security person, that that would be enough. And the truth is, it is not enough. In either case, you have to have somebody in the on the ground who's feeling the pulse of the of the city. So um, I think we realized over time that you can't just depend on a security person, Mm -hmm. that that the decisions about where to go, where not to go really require um, a keen understanding of language and culture of sourcing of, you know, not doing things like going somewhere and then coming back to day and saying, you're going to be back in two days because that makes you vulnerable for kidnapping or um, not going out to a scene right away because there could be a secondary bomb. Mm -hmm. So I think those things are consistent. I think the other big change is when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Egypt, the biggest threat were non-state actors. It was ISIS. It was Al Qaeda. Now, when you're reporting, the biggest threat are state actors, Mm -hmm. the states taking over IEDs um, or rockets being launched by states. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a huge evolution in terms of how we think about security, because you you're not working with a terror group to secure a release of your colleague. You're working with a state Mm -hmm. or you're depending on state relations and diplomacy. So I think those are the big changes that. I think we've learned over time that it's not so easy as to sort of put on a spreadsheet. Here are the threat assessments. This this means we can and can't go. That is a bit more nuanced than that. And that the threats are not from terror groups the way they were just five years ago, right. but for keeping people safe um, while in states that are authoritarian and that view journalism and information as important to warfare as as weapons and tanks. Yeah, and that, that's actually a very good segue into talking about Evan Gershkovich, um, who, just for a little bit of background, we kind of took with this at the beginning, but, you know, Evan ha- had been living in and reporting in Russia uh, for a number of years. Um, he, his parents are both Russian. They had emigrated to the United States. It's actually not that dissimilar from the story that you were telling about your own family. He grew up speaking Russian. Uh, you know, felt a lot of affinity for Russia and felt that it was kind of, you know, there have been profiles written about him lately where he talked about it like um, a home that he felt he was in danger of losing touch with. Uh, So I think it clearly Russia held a lot of allure to him on a personal level, in addition to being a very interesting journalistic story. So um, maybe just like set the scene for us a little bit. How you you work in the Washington Bureau um, of the paper, um, you've bylined stories with Evan before from when he was in Russia. Give us a little sense of what your understanding was as just a member of the paper and on staff. Like, what was Evan doing and and in Russia, kind of what was the the role he was able to fill for the paper? Because listeners may not know this, a lot of news organizations do not have many, and in some cases, any reporters in Russia precisely because they were afraid of what happened to Evan. So give us a little sense of like prior to March 29th, where he fits into the Wall Street Journal daily basis. So we've had extraordinary coverage from our European colleagues. We've had reporters based in Ukraine, in Poland, um, across Eastern Europe and in Moscow. And these were reporters who were accredited by the Russian government. So they were there legally and they were operating as journalists. And there had been no question Evan had been reporting for years. And he just brought an extraordinary eye and voice to what was happening in Russia at the time of this war. And so he wrote really thoughtful pieces about how the pandemic was affecting Russia, how the sanctions were affecting Russia. He gave voice to the Russian experience at this war. And I think the objective was that so often we sort of oversimplify, we we, we call um U.S. adversaries, they're, they're the Russians, and sort of put this blank statement on them in terms of who they are and what they represent. And he was saying these are individuals, these are people, these are families, these are communities yeah. that deserve voice. And so I really enjoyed his reporting because I just thought he gave 
a voice to the, uh, a perspective that was necessary to properly and fully understand the conflict. And, and, Very and yeah. he really did. And, and, and I loved his enthusiasm. It was his first year at the journal. And now I'm showing my age. You love seeing a reporter who's just ready to try and be creative and look for new ways to, to report. And I just, on a personal level, I appreciated that. Yes. I mean, he, and he is still a young reporter. We should remember he, that. I know now, Shane, 31, that's young to us. Okay, well, youngish. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, but but his first, like, being, being going from where he had been to being writing for smaller publications to getting a job as a Russia correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, that is a big deal. Like, that is like, you've, you, you've made it to the major leagues now. It's a huge deal. And he honored that. He ha- He honored that. He wanted to do great work and do it in a responsible way. And so there was so much talk around security. There, I, What I saw was a paper really committed to keeping its journalists safe first and foremost. Um, and at the same time, report the most consequential news story of our time as thoroughly as possible. And so I wasn't part of the discussions around security, but it was always sort of, you could hear it and it was the, it was the constant part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, So you might hear a correspondent has left because we think this would be smart. You might hear we're not going to pursue the story because we think it might be risky. I never saw anyone reckless. I saw an Evan, someone with a lot of enthusiasm who had something to say in a way that most didn't and was there to do it legally and responsibly. And, and I admired him. Do you know, I mean, I, and maybe you don't know, but were there ever, did he ever express any worry or concern that, you know, he knew the risk he, that he, that he could get scooped up or arrested? Or was there ever any, just talk about that among colleagues? Or again, is that something that you know can happen, but you've made a decision to be there, do the job. And so you just do the job. I don't know what those discussions were. I know that he had been followed by the Russian authorities in the course of his time and in Russia, I don't know how often that is. My sense is that that was something that happened to journalists. That's that's the extent of what I know. I know that there was conversations around safety, but I never, I don't know the specifics. Yeah, yeah. I think one something that you know is helpful for listeners to understand too is that you know when the war began, nobody was first off. No one was really sure, kind of like in the Iraq experience, how long the war would last, and there was this expectation. I think in the Pentagon and other quarters too, that the Russians would go in, they would, you know, knock out the Zelensky government, they'd put a government of their choosing in charge, and that kind of things would proceed from there. And I don't know that anybody anticipated that the war would keep going and that the threat to reporters in Russia would become as acute, you know, as it did. And I remember when we started, you know, more or less pulling people back and you could see other, you know, in in, in throughout the coverage reporters that looked like they were probably in Russia, but they weren't datelining anything in Russia or items coming out of Russia, like without bylines on them. In other words, like not having the name of the reporter who wrote it. And it just seemed to me that there was this kind of dawning sense that like, oh God, this is becoming really treacherous now in a way that maybe we had not expected that it would be before the war. And in in a weird way, reporting in Russia seemed to me to be even more dangerous in some ways than reporting in Ukraine, which is not to say that in Ukraine you couldn't get injured or even killed, but you kind of know the risk that you're taking on the battlefield and you can avoid certain places. You can go into the air raid shelter when the sirens are sounding. You can choose to go to the front line or not go. But in Russia, and you talked about like the threat being the state, right? It's suddenly everything is around you. You could be arrested at any time. You could be eating in a cafe the way Evan was, and they come and they scoop you up and throw you in a van. And that just seems to me an entirely different kind of threat and one that, you know, is to me even more menacing, frankly. Sure. I mean, look, when I started in 2003, the, if you said journalists, it was like waving a white flag and you were, you were not to be touched. And obviously that evolved as we became um, negotiation tactics or ways to ransom uh, for terror groups. And now we see states that really treat information as warfare, as part right. of warfare, the distribution of information. And and we've seen this in China, in Iran, in Egypt. Um, 
where where journalists are facing threats. It's funny when when you speak about that. You know what I've been thinking the whole time is those local journalists in those countries, the risk that they're taking. You know, one thing in Iraq that always stood yeah. out to me that that made me not allow myself to feel any real pity is I knew that any time I could leave. It was not my country that was in the middle of war. I could leave. The, the, as hard as I was fighting, I had the option of leaving. And to me, I'm struck by the journalists who who are in these in these countries who continue to report because the bravery that you see from them is extraordinary. Some have been kicked out of their home countries. Some have been arrested. And and so I, when I think about sort of um, what it means to be working in these environments, I'm so struck by, and maybe this is the bias of having lived in Iraq, the, the local journalists who are doing mm. it in their home countries yeah. where where the threat is so imminent. So I, I, that's, I, that's, I, that's what I always think about when I think about that threat. I, th- I think there'd been some assumption, or there has been an assumption in the past that, that states would um, honor the agreements, that if, that if people follow the law, like if you're an accredited journalist, then, then you're recognized as a journalist. So how do you have the imagination to think at any point you could be called something that you are not. Mm-hmm. You are not. How do you, I don't know. I mean, the last time I think I faced that in any way, and it's not anywhere near in comparison, is Egypt, where you, in real time, we were seeing Egypt go from uh, a state where you could um, have elections to, to, and have open press and say things that you could never have said before to seeing the, the, that slowly shut down. And now it's very hard for um, journalists, independent journalists to operate in Egypt. So to your point, I think these things happen. Um, you see them happening in front of you. You see the, the sort of the aperture closing in terms of what you can say or what you can't say. And, and the challenge is, can you, how do you respond? Are you responding fast enough in the appropriate way? And at the same time, honor your commitment to the reader to let them know what's happening because it's so important. And you guys have been doing the journal where I worked for a year or two have has been doing amazing work, keeping other journalists informed about what's going on with Evan's case, doing great coverage of him. Uh, you guys just had a story that I think Vivian Salama did that the State Department has now designated Evan as wrongfully detained, which is important because it, it's them officially saying he's not a spy the way you're accusing him. And now his case is going to be managed by a part of the State Department that can actually negotiate. And I think everyone assumes that the reason the Russians are arresting him and calling him a spy is because they want to then trade him, you know, for somebody in our country who might be a convicted spy or somebody high profile, the way that we ended up trading Victor Boot for Brittany Griner. And so Evan has kind of become a pawn in this. So you've seen these kinds of things play out. I mean, we talked about how, you know, you, you're very familiar with Austin Tice's case, a bit different in that Austin, it's it, it was never, nobody ever announced we're holding him and trying to negotiate for him. Austin has just been kind of missing for many years. But give people a sense of like, this, based on your experience and just following Evan's case, like what happens to him now? Like what can we sort of anticipate is going to be the process by which presumably he eventually gets out, but not until the Russians have obtained something that they want in exchange? Yeah, I mean, the big difference, and you're right to point out, between Austin and Evan's case is we don't know where Austin is. We know where Evan is. And so in terms of the U.S. effort, for cases like Austin, so much of the focus is just finding where he is. Yeah, and he was reporting in Syria at the time. That's right. I'm sorry if I didn't say that earlier. No, I didn't say it either. But with Evan's case, they know where he is. Yeah. They just don't know right now what needs to happen to secure his release because I haven't seen anything that would suggest that some some the Russians have come forth and said, this is what we want. And the challenge is they'll say we're going to go through a trial, but that trial will be held behind closed doors because they're saying, well, given the charge, we can't have an open hearing. So there's no way for us to kind of even get visibility. I mean, as it is, he can't even he hasn't had a visit from from consular services. We haven't this, the U.S. government hasn't gotten eyes on him, which is a right afforded in any other country by now that's a basic right that you're entitled to and so the the answer is i don't know what the process is i don't know because we there's not that if it's happening i haven't seen it that kind of discourse and i think it's part of the 
stress and fear that I personally feel is I, I, I don't know. I can't, I, I assume there'll be a, a, a trial behind closed doors. I don't know on what basis they've held them. I don't know on what basis they would hold a, a case, what that case would involve. And, and so it, it's what makes me personally just so anxious about it. I, I was used to being anxious with Austin and still am because we don't know where he is. And that's something I've had to learn to live with. And I'm hoping that we're not in a situation where I have to try to constantly wonder what is happening. I know where he is and I still don't know. And mm-hmm. that's what scares me. Because I'd, I'd lived for 10 years thinking, okay, if I know where Austin is, we can get on the path to getting him out. And now in Evan's case, I know where he is, but I don't know the path to get him out. Right. And, and what is it like? Because you, you've been in touch with Austin's family too. I mean, what is it like for the families in a situation like this? And, and what it, what do they need? Like, what is it important that they have from the news organization, from the government, in ways of support for, for them? Like, what what is someone like what what are Evan's parents right now in need of that that those people or others can give them? Well, one thing we've seen is a really a real evolution. When Austin was taken in 2012, there was no special envoy for hostage cases, and and. And various parts of government are involved in these cases, and they often operate in silos with different interests. So the State Department's goal, for example, is maintaining diplomatic relations. The FBI, which is in charge of cases of people um, overseas, their their interest is in, prov- is in holding on to evidence to eventually prosecute. The, the National Security Council is interested in sort of the White House policy, the U.S. administration's position at that time. And there was nobody advocating for the hostage. And often... Hostage families were treated as people who couldn't be trusted. They wouldn't give them information. They wouldn't share with them. They wouldn't include them in the conversation. And then in 2014, after three Americans were killed by um, ISIS, and one of them learned about her son's death from a reporter because no one in the U.S. government called, um, there was a push to kind of create the special envoy where somebody's advocating for the family. So now we have that. I don't think from the cheap seats, I don't know if all those problems have been solved, Mm. but there's at least an understanding that the family matters. And I, so I think if you're a family member and you've gone from a a, a life where you're not exposed to this all the time, can you imagine you've gone from being a mother to having to manage um, the negotiation for the release of your child? I think they need And they're getting it. And and I think viewers and readers and listeners have been so amazing and just sort of showing their support for Evan. That's not a small thing. That's not a small thing. It's a big thing to hear that people from around the world are saying we care that that really matters. And I and it's been an extraordinary thing to watch. And I think they need the reassurance from government that they'll be part of the conversation. And that everybody is sort of, and it's already happening, has said, I'm willing to do what I can do to help Evan. And that's been a great thing. So I think the structural fixes in government, the the overwhelmingly uh, gracious support that we've seen, not only from journalists, but from other Americans, and and the sort of that American spirit of saying, what can I do? Because yeah. I think if we work together we can we can help them, and I think all those things are are what are what need to happen and are happening. And um, I, I don't want to speak for them because I I haven't spoken to them, but um, they need it every day until until he's home. Yeah. They need all those all that support. It's it's so important, and I mean I I, I remember you know you alluded to the the hostages, the ISIS hostages who <clears throat> were you know murdered and whose deaths were filmed and put on the internet. Uh, and I, it was at the time I remember so vividly talking to family members who not only could not get answers out of the white house or out of the government, but who felt that the government was intentionally trying to keep them in the dark and sort of manage their loved one's captivity as just a matter of policy. And and in some cases telling them don't speak publicly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this whole question of paying ransoms came up and like some family members believing that they were even being threatened with legal action. They were, that's right. (laughs) You know, if they, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, you know, it was, it was the whole process was like, like the humanity had just been sucked out of it 
you know, like a vacuum. And, and, and it just left these people devastated and feeling entirely alone and worse, feeling like they were being attacked by a government that was supposed to help them. And so you're so right to point out that these structural changes that they make to keep the families more in the loop, it's not just merely cosmetic. I mean, it does put forward a more empathetic face publicly, which I think the government wants, but it's absolutely crucial because every single day that goes by, these people don't know where their son is. They don't know what's happening to him. And so being just more open and honest and kind of putting the family in the front, you know, in the driver's seat with the government, I think has made a world of difference. And I, and I think you're absolutely right that the campaign, I mean, Evan is in one way fortunate that he has other journalists who already kind of have platforms speaking out for him and, you know, writing hashtag I stand with Evan, uh, which you all can do, by the way. Um, but that is a major change in how we think about this. What I also think it's, it's done, and I'm really curious what you think about this, you know, back when the ISIS hostages were taken, there was this whole question around like, well, we can't pay ransom because it will encourage more hostage taking. And this was kind of like the frame of the debate was we can't do anything that will encourage more hostage taking. Now, kind of in the current context of Russia, post Victor Boot trade for Brittany Griner, it seems to me like, no, this is all about trading. And we've kind of crossed that threshold, if you will. I, I still I, I still have misgivings about it only because I'm like, God, if we now created like an incentive economy for Russia to keep kidnapping people. Um, but it does seem to me like basically the question is, all right, what's the trade going to have to be? I mean, I, we haven't gotten there yet, but I just kind of assume that that is the trajectory that his case is going, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and others of Americans who are still there. I mean, do you think that this is that that dynamic has changed too, where we just now talk openly about, all right, what's it going to take to get the person back? Do you know why I'm conflicted? Because these are all in high profile cases. Mm-hmm. You know, there have been 26 hostages who have been released during the Biden administration, 26 in 26 months, basically. How many do we know about? We know yeah. about a few of them. Right. And so I don't know if it's a trend or if we f- it feels like one because it comes up in certain cases, the ones that we we end up focusing on. There are so many cases I don't know about. There are cases where other groups other than the ones where I, I was familiar with covering are involved. But I think you're getting at the point that the way that these are resolved is evolving and has to evolve. And I would just say, I think they're different per person. It's one of the challenges with hostage cases. What worked for one person, even in the same country, might not work for the next person. Every circumstance is different. Yeah. And and I what and it requires a level of creativity, I think, in terms of securing a solution. Uh, that Every case I've covered, even when they look seemingly similar, have so many differences and nuances to them that make resolving them um, uniquely challenging. Mm-hmm. So I, I take your point, like, and I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation that m- worth having. I just wonder if, if, if that's the totality of what we're seeing yeah. or, be, or what, what happened with those other, I don't know, 20 cases that we're not as familiar with, but right. there was, a, the there details? was a solution. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think will be consistent in, you know, is as dangerous as this work is journalists keep doing it. Right. I mean, there will still be reporters who will go into Russia. And, and, and I'm so and glad it. you said that. I'm so glad you said that, because I think people think like when we talk about Evan, this is about the plight of journalists or why are people going there? This is about everybody who believes that information should be flowing, that you have a right to see what's happening, that your understanding of the world, that the ability to make the right decisions hinges on the ability of reporters to operate. This is not about journalism per se. This Evan's story is not about, well, this is a journalist issue. It is not. It is freedom of the press, mm-hmm. not only for us, but in our understanding of the world. And that if we capitulate, I would argue, to sort of state owned media and sort of say, you know what? That's okay. Well, well, we don't need journalists there because they're state owned. We are, we are, for, we're losing the opportunity to understand, understand critical issues. And, and by the way, that's part of the. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I have a little ongoing battle with the Pentagon every day, and it's for that same reason. I'm constantly fighting for information because I believe the public. I, I believe in my whole of hearts that 
My, my responsibility is to fight for information because the public has a right to know. I mean, my favorite thing about working for the Wall Street Journal is um, how much respect it shows for the mm. reader. I think so many um, news outlets will sort of push an opinion on the reader. This is how you should think about it. And we just don't have that option. Yeah. I, I'm, I, as you can sense, although I'm not supposed to have an opinion, there's a, there's a ticker tape of opinions running past You might my, have a few. Uh, just a few, them. all the time, about everything. But when I write a story, I am saying to the reader, my job is to present it to you and let you decide. Right. And that can only happen if and behind the scenes, we are all pushing for that information right. to be available to you. Yeah. And so, yes, they are going to keep reporting. Yeah. And it's essential that they do. Absolutely. We're talking about war. We're talking about a war that the United States has described between autocracy and democracy. We need to know as much about that as possible. I want to, in the few minutes we have left, actually, and I did not tell you I was going to ask you about this, but there's a lot of um, information flow from the Pentagon in the past few days, <laughs> which you and I are both paying a lot of attention to. Um, this extraordinary, like, <laughs> you're just like shaking your head, this extraordinary leak of classified intelligence documents from we still don't really know where. Um, I just, what's your, what's your take on this? And like, what do you, I mean, you're, you're inside that building a lot and know the leadership of that building very well. And a lot of these documents were marked for what looked to be like briefings for yeah. leadership. Yeah. yeah. And they were not. So like, I mean, what, what is your thinking on the, the Pentagon leak story? We're now in day six of or whatever. So dear listeners, get ready. Cause in those six days I have gone from, this was inadvertent. Maybe somebody left him and then they got into the wrong hands to this was, this was intentional to maybe it was wrong hands. Like I keep going back and forth about how it happened in terms of uh, intent. Obviously there was some malintent because they were published, but you notice that some the documents they're all folded. Yes. Like somebody put them in their pocket. Mm. And I, I, I thought maybe somebody left a thumb drive because like I have a, a source who just keeps saying the Churchill quote, please stop assigning malfeasance to what is just ineptitude. And I'm like, and I can believe ineptitude all the time, right? Yeah. I, I can buy that argument, except here, I just can't quite get there. It looks intentional because they're It folded. looks intentional. And I just don't know the degree of it. I will say this is a war that, um, as you noted, was supposed to be a few weeks and was not. And it has created a massive effort. And with that comes massive amounts of information flowing every single day, going into hands that didn't think they were going to be a part of this conflict at all. And so I think that you could argue that th this was a, an environment that was more vulnerable to this kind of leak. Mm. But to the conversation we're having earlier, and this is pure speculation, uh, I wonder if um, how much the lack of transparency has contributed. I I'm just curious down the road if we'll discover that that was a factor, if this in fact turns out to be an intentional leak. Mm. Because the documents are interesting to me. Some of them contradict what the U.S. said its policy was or how it was approaching things. And we've seen in past leaks, often when it's intentional and done so aggressively, it's because people feel like information isn't getting out. Right. And so when we talk about transparency, it's not – there are consequences potentially – for not sharing information to the public, it, the information that they have a right to know in an honest way. And I, in, my, in the back of my head, I, I, I don't, this is all to say, I don't know. And again, I go back and forth. But a little part of me wonders, are we going to discover there's a connection between um, the lack of information that we've been getting throughout the war and this leak? That's just sort of the, I, I know. Somebody who like wanted that. it out so that people understood more about yeah. what was happening. Yeah. yeah. I, I have no reason. I have no basis for that, but just having covered WikiLeaks and seeing that there's the Pentagon has not been as in, willing as it was in past conflicts to share mm. um, information. I mean, even on this, they said they're launching an investigation. They won't tell you who's doing the investigation. We knew we knew who was doing that for WikiLeaks. They who had who had on um, the documents quote a variety of people. I, I think the public is entitled to more information than that. And it seems like this has really rattled the Pentagon, too, at, of course. The, at the joint chief's level. Of course. Can you imagine? We're talking about a scenario where there is a mole who went through a month-long extensive background check yeah. to then be betraying their country. That's the worst. It's the worst case scenario. They must be, like, looking over their shoulders to some degree. Of course. Of him, course. And, 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 and presumably, like, you know, 
obviously there's an investigation going on to it now too, but like people probably playing a, a guessing game is who could it be based on who would have access to information. That's right. Like that. Who had access, who printed it because there's a system that checks it. Was it printed? Or did someone like put it on a flash drive and then take it somewhere else to be printed? Right. Right. How did it end up from this website to that website? How was it able to stay online for days and days and days before anybody in the U S government knew how much more is out there potentially? Yeah. Are we going to have a steady stream of this? And how does it affect relationships going forward? You know, remember in the run up to the war, there was all this. I don't know if we can share information with the Ukrainians. The U.S. was saying because we don't want information to get out. And look what's happened. Look what's happened. How do you share information? How do you, especially when when you're not a hundred percent sure about the ability of a nation to secure them? I don't think this just affects the war in Ukraine. I think it'll affect because there are a lot of countries that are touched in that leak. Yeah. How does that affect relations yes. going forward? Absolutely. Um, well, you're going to get going, but before you do, it is our tradition on Chatter that the last question is I reach into the Chatter box and ask you oh, a pre-selected yeah. question at random. So here, here you go. I'm ready. Your, as ready your, as I'll ever be. Your question is, uh, if you could go back in time, what piece of advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Um have faith that it's going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to. Mm. And you feel like it did for you. Yeah. I think personally and professionally, I feel yeah. really, I never dreamed of any of this. And, yeah. uh, and I feel so, so lucky. It's such an honor to do this job. Yeah. It's such a responsibility. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a crazy most days and tired and exhausted. <laughs> and um, my, my, my child said to me yesterday, She'll never want to be a journalist. I was like, okay, well, good. Then I've done something here. Yeah, I don't, exactly. don't get me wrong. It's, 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 it's really hard and demanding, but my goodness, to be in the first row watching history unfold and get paid for it yeah. is amazing. Yeah. I love that you have that perspective because, you know, you and I have known each other a long time and we've both been through ups and downs and moments of like real happiness and great uncertainty but for you, I mean, everything has worked out so beautifully. Like you're a fantastic reporter. You work in a great place. You have a beautiful family. And like all these things that I know from knowing you that are important to you and that you have wanted, like you have them. And I love that you never take them for granted. You're one of the most grateful people I know. Well, thank you. And I, I, I feel so, so lucky. I mean, I, I got married later than most and all of that. And I just... Um, I just wish someone had told me it's going to work out yeah. because you got I, I always tell my husband, I should have enjoyed that, that freedom more. And what <laughs> <laughs> before I should have your ass. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I was all anxious the whole time. Little did I know. Right. Right. It's good advice. I love it. Uh, well, Nancy Youssef, this has been so much fun. Thank you for spending time on a busy, I've busy time. It. And, and thank you for, for being on here and giving some voice to, to Evan and what it's like for him uh, and for a reminder for, a lot of other people who are not home with their loved ones to, to keep them in our thoughts and keep pushing for them. Uh, that support means all the world. Thank you. I really love the conversation. I love seeing you. I love seeing you too. I love being interviewed by you because I feel like I've learned. Thank you. You're the best. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Thank you.